Moxon's Master by Ambrose Bierce. Are you serious? Do you really believe that a machine thinks? I got no immediate reply. Moxon was apparently intent upon the coals in the grate, touching them deftly here and there with the fire poker, till they signified a sense of his attention by a brighter glow. For several weeks I had been observing in him a growing habit of delay in answering even the most trivial of commonplace questions. His air, however, was that of preoccupation rather than deliberation. One might even have said that he had something on his mind. Presently, he said, What is a machine? The word has been variously defined. Here is one definition from a popular dictionary. Any instrument or organization by which power is applied and made effective or a desired effect produced. Well then, is not a man a machine? And you will admit that he thinks, or thinks he thinks, if you do not wish to answer my question, I said rather testily, why not say so? All that you say is mere evasion. You know well enough that when I say machine, I do not mean a man, but something that man has made and controls. When it does not control him, he said, rising abruptly and looking out of a window, whence nothing was visible in the blackness of a stormy night. A moment later he turned about and with a smile said, I beg your pardon, I had no thought of evasion. I considered the dictionary man's unconscious testimony suggestive and worth something in the discussion. I can give your question a direct answer easily enough. I do believe that the machine thinks about the work that it is doing. I was direct enough, certainly. It was not altogether pleasing, for it tended to confirm a sad suspicion that Moxon's devotion to study and work in his machine shop had not been good for him. I knew, for one thing, that he suffered from insomnia, and that is no light affliction. Had it affected his mind? His reply to my question seemed to me then evidence that it had. Perhaps I should think differently about it now. I was younger then, and among the blessings that are not denied to youth is ignorance. Incited by that great stimulant to controversy, I said, And what, pray, does it think with, in the absence of a brain? The reply, coming with less than his customary delay, took his favourite form of counter-interrogation. With what does a plant think, in the absence of a brain? Ah, plants also belong to the philosopher class. I should be pleased to know some of their conclusions. You may omit the premises. Perhaps, he replied, apparently unaffected by my foolish irony, you may be able to infer their convictions from their acts. I will spare you the familiar examples of the sensitive mimosa the several insectivorous flowers, and those whose stamens bend down and shake their pollen upon the entering bee in order that he may fertilize their distant mates. But observe this. In an open spot in my garden I planted a climbing vine. When it was barely above the surface I set a stake into the soil a yard away. The vine at once made for it, but as it was about to reach it after several days I removed it a few feet. The vine at once altered its course, making an acute angle and again made for the stake. This manoeuvre was repeated several times, but finally, as if discouraged, the vine abandoned the pursuit and, ignoring further attempts to divert it, travelled to a small tree farther away, which it climbed. Roots of the eucalyptus will prolong themselves incredibly in search of moisture. A well-known horticulturalist relates that one entered an old drain pipe and followed it until it came to a break, where a section of the pipe had been removed to make way for a stone wall that had been built across its course. The root left the drain and followed the wall until it found an opening where a stone had fallen out. It crept through, and following the other side of the wall back to the drain, and... And all this? Can you miss the significance of it? It shows the consciousness of plants. It proves that they think. Even if it did, what then? We were speaking not of plants, but of machines. They may be composed partly of wood, wood that has no longer vitality, or wholly of metal. Is thought an attribute also of the mineral kingdom? How else do you explain the phenomena of crystallization? <laughs> I do not explain them, because you cannot without affirming what you wish to deny, namely, 
intelligent cooperation among the constituent elements of the crystals. When soldiers form lines or hollow squares, you call it reason. When wild geese in flight take the form of a letter V, you say instinct. When the homogeneous atoms of a mineral moving freely in solution arrange themselves into shapes mathematically perfect or particles of frozen moisture into the symmetrical and beautiful forms of snowflakes, you have nothing to say. You have not even invented a name to conceal your heroic unreason. Moxon was speaking with unusual earnestness. As he paused, I heard in an adjoining room known to me as his machine shop, which no one but himself was permitted to enter, a singular thumping sound, as of someone pounding upon a table with an open hand. Moxon heard it at the same moment. Visibly agitated, he rose and hurriedly passed into the room whence it came. I thought it odd that anyone else should be in there, and my interest in my friend, with doubtless a touch of unwarrantable curiosity, led me to listen intently, though I am happy to say, not at the keyhole. They were confused sounds, as of a struggle or scuffle. The floor shook. I distinctly heard hard breathing and a hoarse whisper which said, Damn you! Then all was silent, and presently Moxon appeared, and said with a rather sorry smile, Pardon me for leaving so abruptly. I have a machine in there that lost its temper, and cut up rough. Fixing my eyes steadily upon his left cheek, which was traversed by four parallel excoriations, showing blood, I said, How would it do to trim its nails? I could have spared myself the jest. He gave it no attention, but seated himself in the chair that he had left, and resumed the interrupted monologue as if nothing had occurred. Doubtless you do not hold with those, I need not name them to a man of your reading, who have taught that all matter is sentient, that every atom is a living, feeling, conscious being. I do. There is no such thing as dead, inert matter. It is all alive, all instinct with force actual and potential, all sensitive to the same forces in its environment and susceptible to the contagion of higher and subtler ones residing in such superior organisms as it may be brought into relation with, as those of man when he is fashioning it into an instrument of his will. It absorbs something of his intelligence and purpose, more of them in proportion to the complexity of the resulting machine and that of its work. Do you happen to recall Herbert Spencer's definition of life? I read it thirty years ago. He may have altered it afterward for anything I know, but... In all that time, I have been unable to think of a single word that could profitably be changed, added, or removed. It seems to me not only the best definition, but the only possible one. Life, he says, is a definite combination of heterogeneous changes, both simultaneous and successive, in correspondence with external coexistences and sequences. That defines the phenomenon, I said, but gives no hint of its cause. That he replied, is all that any definition can do. As Mill points out, we know nothing of cause except as an antecedent, nothing of effect except as a consequent. Of certain phenomena, one never occurs without another, which is dissimilar. The first in point of time we call cause, the second effect. One who had many times seen a rabbit pursued by a dog, and had never seen rabbits and dogs otherwise, would then think the rabbit the cause of the dog. But I fear, he added, laughing naturally enough, that my rabbit is leading me a long way from the track of my legitimate quarry. I am indulging in the pleasure of the chase for its own sake. What I want you to observe is that in Herbert Spencer's definition of life, the activity of a machine is included. There is nothing in the definition that is not applicable to it. According to this sharpest of observers and deepest of thinkers, if a man during his period of activity is alive, so is a machine when in operation. As an inventor and constructor of machines, I know that to be true. Moxon was silent for a long time, gazing absently into the fire. 
It was growing late, and I thought it time to be going, but somehow I did not like the notion of leaving him in that isolated house, all alone except for the presence of some person of whose nature my conjectures could go no further than that it was unfriendly, perhaps malign. Leaning towards him and looking earnestly into his eyes, while making a motion with my hand through the door of his workshop, I said, Moxon, who have you in there? Somewhat to my surprise, he laughed and answered without hesitation, <laughs> Nobody. The incident that you have in mind was caused by my folly in leaving a machine in action with nothing to act upon, while I undertook the interminable task of enlightening your understanding. Do you happen to know that consciousness is the creature of rhythm? Oh, bother them both, I replied, rising and laying hold of my overcoat. I'm going to wish you good night, and I'll add the hope that the machine which you inadvertently left in action will have her gloves on the next time you think it needful to stop her. Without waiting to observe the effect of my shot, I left the house. Rain was falling, and the darkness was intense. In the sky beyond the crest of a hill toward which I groped my way, along precarious plank sidewalks and across miry, unpaved streets, I could see the faint glow of the city's lights. But behind me nothing was visible but a single window of Moxon's house. It glowed with what seemed to me a mysterious and fateful meaning. I knew it was an uncurtained aperture in my friend's machine shop, and I had little doubt that he had resumed the studies interrupted by his duties as my instructor in mechanical consciousness and the fatherhood of rhythm. Odd, and in some degree humorous, as his conviction seemed to me at that time, I could not wholly divest myself of the feeling that they had some tragic relation to his life and could entertain the notion that they were the vagaries of a disordered mind. Whatever might be thought of his views, his exposition of them was too logical. Over and over, his last words came back to me. Consciousness is the creature of rhythm. Bald and terse as the statement was, I now found it infinitely alluring. At each recurrence it broadened in meaning, deepened in suggestion. Why, here I thought, is something upon which to found a philosophy. If consciousness is the product of rhythm, all things are conscious, for all have motion, and all motion is rhythmic. I wondered if Moxon knew the significance and breadth of his thought, the scope of this momentous generalization, or had he arrived at his philosophic faith by the torturous and uncertain road of observation. That faith was then new to me, and all Moxon's expounding had failed to make me a convert, but now it seemed as if a great light shone about me, like that which fell upon Saul of Tarsus, and out there in the storm and darkness and solitude I experienced what Luz calls the endless variety and excitement of philosophic thought. I exulted in a new sense of knowledge, a new pride of reason, my feet seemed hardly to touch the earth. It was as if I were uplifted and borne through the air by invisible wings. Water break, folks, one second. Yielding to an impulse to seek further light from him whom I now recognized as my master and guide, I had unconsciously turned about, and almost before I was aware of having done so, found myself again at Moxon's door. I was drenched with rain, but felt no discomfort. Unable in my excitement to find the doorbell, I instinctively tried the knob. It turned, and, entering, I mounted the stairs to the room that I had so recently left. All was dark and silent. Moxon, as I had supposed, was in the machine shop. Groping along the wall until, found, until I found the communicating door, I knocked loudly several times, but got no response, which I attributed to the uproar outside. The wind was blowing a gale and dashing the rain against the thin walls and sheets. The drumming upon the shingle roof spanning the unceilinged room was loud and incessant. I had never been invited into the machine shop, had, indeed, been denied admittance, as had all others, with one exception. A skilled metal worker, of whom no one knew anything except that his name was Haley, and his habit, silence. But in my spiritual exaltation, discretion and civility were alike forgotten, and I opened the door. What I saw took all philosophical speculation out of me, in short order. Moxon sat facing me at the farther side of a small table, upon which a single candle made all the light that was in the room. 
Opposite him, his back toward me, sat another person. On the table between the two was a chessboard. The men were playing. I knew little of chess, but as only a few pieces were on the board, it was obvious the game was near its close. Moxon was intensely interested. Not so much, it seemed to me, in the game, as in his antagonist, upon whom he had fixed so intent a look, that standing though I did directly in the line of his vision, I was altogether unobserved. His face was ghostly white. His eyes glittered like diamonds. Of his antagonist I had only a back view, but that was sufficient. I should not have cared to see his face. He was apparently not more than five feet in height, with proportions suggesting those of a gorilla, a tremendous breadth of shoulders, thick, short neck and broad squat head, which had a tangled growth of black hair and was topped with a crimson fez. A tunic of the same colour, belted tightly to the waist, reached the seat, apparently a box, upon which he sat. His legs and feet were not seen. His left forearm appeared to rest in his lap. He moved his pieces with his right hand, which seemed disproportionately long. I had shrunk back and now stood a little to one side of the doorway and in shadow. If Moxon had looked further than the face of his opponent, he could have observed nothing now, except that the door was open. Something forbade me either to enter or to retire, a feeling, I know not how it came, that I was in the presence of an imminent tragedy and might serve my friend by remaining. With a scarcely conscious rebellion against the indelicacy of the act, I did so. The play was rapid. Moxon hardly glanced at the board before making his moves, and to my unskilled eye seemed to move the piece most convenient to his hand, his motions in doing so quick, nervous, lacking in precision. The response of his antagonist, while equally prompt in the inception, was made with a slow, uniform, mechanical, and I thought somewhat theatrical movement of the arm. It was a sore trial to my patience. There was something unearthly about it all, and I caught myself shuddering, but I was wet and cold. Two or three times, after moving a piece, the stranger slightly inclined his head, and each time I observed that Moxon shifted his king. All at once the thought came to me that the man was dumb, and then that he was a machine, an automaton chess player. Then I remembered that Moxon had once spoken to me of having invented such a piece of mechanism, though I did not understand that it had actually been constructed. Was all his talk about the consciousness and intelligence of machines merely a prelude to eventual exhibition of this device, only a trick to intensify the effect of its mechanical action upon me in ignorance of its secret? A fine end, this, of all my intellectual transports. My endless variety and excitement of philosophic thought. I was about to retire in disgust when something occurred to hold my curiosity. I observed a shrug of the thing's great shoulders as if it were irritated, and so natural was this, so entirely human, that in my new view of the matter it startled me. Nor was that all, for a moment later it struck the table sharply with its clenched hand. At that gesture, Moxon seemed even more startled than I. He pushed his chair a little backward in alarm. Presently, Moxon, whose play it was, raised his hand high above the board, pounced upon one of his pieces like a sparrowhawk, and with the exclamation, Checkmate! rose quickly to his feet and stepped behind his chair. The automaton sat motionless. The wind had now gone down, but I heard at lessening intervals, and progressively louder, the rumble of thunder. In the pauses between, I now became conscious of a low humming or buzzing, which, like the thunder, grew momentarily louder and more distinct. It seemed to come from the body of the automaton, and was unmistakably a whirring of wheels. It gave me the impression of a disordered mechanism which had escaped the repressive and regulating action of some controlling part, an effect such as might be expected if a pull should be jostled from the teeth of a ratchet wheel. But before I had time for such m conjecture as to its nature, my attention was taken by the strange motions of the automaton itself. A slight but continuous convulsion appeared to have taken possession of it. In body and head it shook like a man with an ague chill, and the motion augmented every moment until the entire figure was in violent agitation. Suddenly it sprang to its feet, and with a movement almost too quick for the eye to follow, shot forward across table and chair, with both arms thrust forth to their full length, the posture and lunge of a diver. Moxon tried to throw himself backward out of reach, 
but he was too late. I saw the horrible thing's hand close upon his throat, his own clutch its wrists. Then the table was overturned, candle thrown to the floor and extinguished, and all was black dark. The noise of the struggle was dreadfully distinct, and most terrible of all were the raucous, squawking sounds made by the strangled man's efforts to breathe. Guided by the infernal hubbub, I sprang to the rescue of my friend, but had hardly taken a stride in the darkness when the whole room blazed with a blinding white light that burned into my brain and heart and memory, a vivid picture of the combatants on the floor. Moxon underneath, his, his eyes protruding, his mouth wide open, and his tongue thrust out, and horrible contrast, the painted face of his assassin, an expression of tranquil and profound thought, as in the solution of a problem in chess. This I observed, then all was blackness and silence. Three days later, I recovered consciousness in a hospital. As the memory of that tragic night slowly evolved in my ailing brain, I recognized in my attendant, Moxon's confidential workman, Haley. Responding to a look, he approached, smiling. Tell me about it, I managed to say, faintly. All about it. Certainly, he said. You were carried unconscious from a burning house, Moxon's. Nobody knows how you came to be there. You may have to do a little explaining. The origin of the fire is a bit mysterious, too. My own notion is that the house was struck by lightning. And Moxon, buried yesterday, what was left of him. Apparently, this reticent person could unfold himself on occasion. When imparting shocking intelligence to the sick, he was affable enough. After some moments of the keenest mental suffering, I ventured to ask another question. Who rescued me? Well, if it interests you, I did. Thank you, Mr. Haley, and may God bless you for it. Did you rescue also that charming product of your skill, the automaton chess player that murdered its inventor? The man was silent a long time, looking away from me. Presently, he turned and gravely said, Do you know that? I do, I replied. I saw it done. That was many years ago. If asked today, I would answer less confidently. There you go, folks. That's the first one. I'm now going to take a small drink of water and then introduce you to the widower Termor. He's awful. You're going to love him. Yeah, Margaret was just talking about the implications of that story. The, the, the sudden explosive rise of consciousness in there and, and emotion, the fact... Or the fact that he doesn't say why he would answer differently today. What happens because of his answer? Is he writing from prison? What Ex happened? Exactly. Why is his answer different? Is he writing, as Margaret says, from prison? Has something changed? Or is he less certain of what he saw? Right, and now, let's jump across to the Widow of Turmoil. This is another Ambrose Beers. The circumstances upon which Joram Turmoil became a widower have never been popularly understood. I know them, naturally, for I am Joram Turmoil, and my wife, the late Elizabeth Mary Turmoil, is by no means ignorant of them. But although she doubtless relates them, yet they remain a secret, for not a soul has ever believed her. When I married Elizabeth Mary Jonin, she was very wealthy. Otherwise I could hardly have afforded to marry, for I had not a cent, and heaven had not put into my heart any intention to earn one. I held the professorship of cats in the University of Greymalkin, and scholastic pursuits had unified me for the heat and burden of business or labour. Moreover, I could not forget that I was a Turmor, a member of a family whose motto from the time of William of Normandy has been Laborori est errore, the only known inflection of the sacred family tradition 
occurred when Sir Aldebaran Turmor, de Peter's Turmor, an illustrious master burglar of the 17th century, personally assisted at a difficult operation by some of his, undertaken by some of his workmen. That blot upon our escutcheon cannot be contemplated without the most poignant mortification. My incumbency of the chair of cats in the Grey Malkin University had not, of course, been marked by any instance of mean industry. There had never, at any one time, been more than two students of the noble science, and by merely repeating the manuscript lectures of my predecessor, which I had found amongst his effects, he died at sea on his way to Malta, I could sufficiently sate their famine for knowledge without really earning even the distinction which served in place of salary. Naturally, under the straitened circumstances, I regarded Elizabeth Mary as a kind of special providence. She, unwisely, refused to share her fortune with me, but for that I cared nothing. For, although by the laws of that country, as is well known, a wife has control of her separate property during her life, it passes to the husband at her death. Nor can she dispose of it otherwise by will. The mortality among wives is considerable, but not excessive. <coughs> Pardon me. Having married Elizabeth Mary, and, as it were, ennobled her by making her a turmoil, I felt that the manner of her death ought, in some sense, to match her social distinction. If I should remove her by way of the ordinary marital methods, I should incur a just reproach as one destitute of a proper family pride. Yet I could not hit upon a suitable plan. In this emergency, I decided to consult the Termor Archives, a, pro a priceless collection of documents comprising the records of the family from the time of its founder in the 7th century of our era. I knew that among those sacred monuments, I should find detailed accounts of all the principal murders committed by my sainted ancestors for forty generations. From that mass of papers, I could hardly fail to derive the most valuable of suggestions. <coughs> the collection contained also most interesting relics. There were patents of nobility granted to my forefathers for daring and ingenious removal of pretenders to thrones, or occupants of thrones. Stars, crosses, other decorations attesting services to the most secret and unmentionable character, miscellaneous gifts from the world's greatest conspirators, representing an intrinsic money value beyond computation. There were robes, jewels, swords of honor, every kind of testimonials of esteem. A king's skull fashioned into a wine cup, the title deeds to vast estates, long alienated by confiscation, sale or abandonment, an illuminated breviary that had belonged to Sir Aldebaran Turmor, Sir Peter's turmoil of accursed memory, embalmed ears of several of the family's most renowned enemies, the small intestine of a certain unworthy Italian salesman, inimical to turmoils which, twisted into a jumping rope, had served the youth of six kindred generations, mementos, souvenirs, precious beyond the appraisals of imagination, but by the sacred mandates of tradition and sentiment, forever inalienable by sale or gift. As the head of the family, I was custodian of all these priceless heirlooms, and for their safe keeping had constructed in the basement of my dwelling a strong room of massive masonry, whose solid stone walls and single iron door could defy alike the earthquake shock, the tireless assaults of time, and cupidity's unholy hand. To this the sorest of the soul, redolent of sentiment and tenderness, and rich in suggestions of crime, I now repaired for hints upon assassination. To my unspeakable astonishment and grief, I found it empty. Every shelf, every chest, every coffer had been rifled. Of that unique and incomparable collection, not a vestige remained. Yet I passed and proved that until I had myself unlocked the massive metal door, not a bolt nor bar had been disturbed. The seals upon the lock had been intact. I passed the night in alternate lamentation and research, equally fruitless. 
The mystery was impenetrable to conjecture, the pain invincible to balm. But never once throughout that dreadful night did my firm spirit relinquish its high design against Elizabeth Mary, and daybreak found me more resolute than before to harvest the fruits of my marriage. My great loss seemed but to bring me into nearer spiritual relations with my dead ancestors, and to lay upon me a new and more inevitable obedience to the suasion that spoke in every part of my blood. <coughs> my plan of action was soon formed, and, procuring a stout cord, I entered my wife's bedroom, finding her, as I expected, in a sound sleep. Before she was awake, I had her bound fast hand and foot. She was greatly surprised, and pained, but I carried her into the now rifled strong room, which I had never suffered her to enter, and of whose treasures I had not apprised her. Seating her, still bound, in an angle of the wall, I passed the next two days and nights in conveying bricks and mortar to the spot. On the morning of the third day, I had her securely walled in from floor to ceiling. All this time I gave no further heed to her pleas for mercy than on her assurances of non-resistance, which I am bound to say she honourably observed, to grant her the freedom of her limbs. The space allowed her was about four feet by six. As I inserted the last bricks of the top course in contact with the ceiling of the strong room, she bade me farewell with what I deemed the composure of despair, and I rested from my work, feeling that I had faithfully observed the traditions of an ancient and illustrious family. My only bitter ref <coughs> pardon me, my only bitter reflection, so far as my own conduct was concerned, came of the consciousness that in the performance of my design I had laboured, but this no living soul would ever know. After a night's rest, I went to the judge of the Court of Successions and Inheritances, and made a true and sworn relation of all that I had done, except that I ascribed to a servant the manual labour of building the wall. His horror, pardon me, his honour appointed a court commissioner, who made a careful examination of the work, and upon his report, Elizabeth Mary Turmore was, at the end of a week, formally pronounced dead. By due process of law, I was put into possession of her estate, and though she was not by hundreds of thousands of dollars as valuable as my lost treasures, it raised me from poverty to affluence, and brought me the respect of the great and the good. Some six months after these events, strange rumours reached me that the ghost of my deceased wife had been seen in several places about the country, always at a considerable distance from Greymelkin. These rumours, which I was unable to trace to any authentic source, differed widely in many particulars, but were alike in ascribing to the apparition a certain high degree of apparent worldly prosperity, combined with an audacity most uncommon in ghosts. Not only was the spirit attired in most costly raiment, but it walked at noonday. It even drove. I was inexplicably annoyed by these reports, and thinking there might be something more than superstition in the popular belief that only the spirits of the unburied dead still walk the earth, I took some workmen equipped with picks and crowbars into the now long unentered strong room, and ordered them to demolish the brick wall that I had built about the partner of my joys. I was resolved to give the body of Elizabeth Mary such burial as I thought her immortal part might be willing to accept as an equivalent to the privilege of ranging at will among the haunts of the living. In a few minutes we had broken down the wall, and, thrusting a lamp through the breach, I looked in. Nothing. Not a bone, not a lock of hair, not a shred of clothing. The narrow space upon which, upon my affidavit, had been legally declared to hold all that was mortal of the late Mrs. Turmore was absolutely empty. This amazing disclosure, coming upon a mind already overwrought with too much of mystery and excitement, was more than I could bear. I shrieked aloud and fell in a fit. For months afterwards I lay between life and death, fevered and delirious, nor did I recover until my physician had had the providence to take a case of valuable jewels from my safe and leave the country. The next summer I had occasion to visit my wine cellar in one corner of which I had built the now long-disused strong room. 
In moving a cask of Madeira, I struck it with considerable force against the partition wall, and was surprised to observe it displaced two large square stones forming part of that wall. Applying my hands to these, I easily pushed them out entirely, and looking through saw that they had fallen into the niche in which I had immured my lamented wife, facing the opening which their fall left, and at a distance of four feet was the brickwork which my own hands had made for that unfortunate gentlewoman's restraint. At this significant revelation, I began a search of the wine cellar. Behind a row of casks, I, pardon me, behind a row of casks, I found four historically interesting, but intrinsically valueless objects. First, the mildewed remains of a ducal robe of state of the 11th century. Second, an illuminated vellum breviary with the name of Sir Aldebaran Termor de Peter's Termor inscribed in colors of the title page. Third, a human skull fashioned into a drinking cup and deeply stained with wine. Fourth, the iron cross of a knight commander of the Imperial Austrian Order of Assassins by Poison. That was all. Not an object having commercial value, no papers, nothing. But this was enough to clear up the mystery of the strong room. My wife had early divined the existence and purpose of that apartment, and with the skill amounting to genius, had effected an entrance by loosening the two stones in the wall. Through that opening, she had at several times abstracted the entire collection, which doubtless she had succeeded in converting into coin of the realm, when, with an unconscious justice which deprives me of all satisfaction in the memory, I decided to build her into the wall. By some malign fatality, I selected that part of it in which were those movable stones. And doubtless before I had fairly finished my bricklaying, she had removed them, and, slipping through into the wine cellar, replaced them as they were originally laid. From the cellar she had easily escaped, unobserved, to enjoy her infamous gains in distant pasts. I have endeavoured to procure a warrant, but the Lord High Baron of the Court of Indictment and Conviction reminds me that she is legally dead, and says my only course is to go before the Master in Cadavery and move for a writ of disinterment and constructive revival. So, it looks as if I must suffer, without redress, this great wrong at the hands of a woman devoid alike of principle and shame.